This is Math 251, section 12.4 on partial derivatives. So as we start to think about how to take derivatives of a multivariable function, I'd like to go back to the interpretation that we knew for derivatives from Calculus 1. Specifically, from Calc 1, we always said the derivative represented the slope of a tangent line. Here's the problem with multivariable functions. We know that a function like z equals f of x and y graphs as a whole surface. Right? So this is just sort of a generic graph showing some surface, z equals f of x and y. If I pick a point on that surface, and I say, well, I want the derivative at that point to represent the slope of the tangent line, the problem is there's infinitely many tangent lines to the surface at that point, right? There'd be a whole big bunch of them, all perfectly tangent at that specific point. So I can't interpret it exactly as the slope of the tangent line to a surface. There's too many of them. The solution to this problem is to use what are called partial derivatives. To find a partial derivative, we're going to treat one of our variables as a constant, and then we'll take the derivative with respect to the other variable. Here's what's really happening geometrically when we do that. Let's suppose that I wanted to take the partial derivative with respect to x. Notation here, these little Greek letter deltas instead of the usual d indicate partial derivative of z with respect to x, or with function notation I can have a little f sub x. Those both mean partial derivative with respect to x. What that's telling me is let's treat y as a constant. And notice in the diagram, they've just sort of randomly selected some constant value b for y. And this vertical plane here has the same y value everywhere. Notice the axes are oriented a little differently than what we're used to. This is my y-axis, so every point on this plane has the constant value for y, y equals b. If you slice through the surface using that plane, you end up with this curve of intersection between the original surface and the plane y equals b. If I now say, could I find the tangent line to that curve at my point, now I would say yes, and there's only one possibility, right? Right here, I would just have one single tangent line. The slope of that tangent line is the partial derivative of z with respect to x at that particular point. Of course, I'd get a different value if I picked a different point, but I can now interpret it as the slope of a tangent line because I've just got one curve, not a whole surface, to find the tangent line for. We can also do this the other way. We could find the derivative of f or z with respect to y. Here's our notation, partial of z with respect to y, or f sub y. And in this case, we're going to treat x as the constant. So again, notice the x's are in the same kind of unusual position, but here's the x-axis. And we've selected the x value a to stay constant. And you can see this vertical plane at x equal a intersecting our surface. And we have this curve of intersection again between that plane x equals a constant and the original surface. And now at a particular point, it makes sense to ask about the slope of a tangent line. So again, the slope of that tangent line in this case would be the partial of z with respect to y. So that's what's going on geometrically. We can still use the slope of the tangent line interpretation, but we always have to kind of temper that with the idea that we're insisting 
that one variable or the other stays constant. Another interpretation for derivatives that we used frequently was the idea of the derivative being the rate of change. And we could also use that interpretation for partial derivatives. So if I said I wanted the partial derivative of z with respect to x, that's how fast is z changing with respect to x. Again, assuming y is held constant. The other way around, the partial derivative of z with respect to y, or rate of change of z with respect to y, assumes that x is held constant. Same interpretation, just put into words rather than geometrically interpreted. All right, in this section, we're mostly going to concentrate on the mechanics of finding partial derivatives. And we'll actually return to these interpretations as we study applications of the partial derivative a little bit later in the chapter. So, a few words about mechanics of finding partial derivatives. The mechanics all go back to the idea of treating one of the variables as a constant. So in our first example, we've got a function of x and y here. And I would like to find both of the partial derivatives, f with respect to x, and f with respect to y. So when I go to do f with respect to x, I'm going to remember here that as I do this, I have to treat y as a constant. So my derivative is going to be, what, uh, 8x cubed? That's just sort of normal. But then here, remember, if y is a constant, the derivative of y squared, that's just a constant. And the derivative of any constant would be 0. Plus, here 5y cubed is a constant multiplier. And I'm going to multiply that by the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. So I end up with 8x cubed plus 10xy cubed. All right, let's do the derivative of f with respect to y. Again, the derivative is with respect to y. y is the variable. That means we're treating x as our constant. So in this case, 2x to the fourth, x is a constant, that whole term is constant, and its derivative is 0. Minus y is our variable, so the derivative of y squared is 2y, just as usual. Plus, 5x squared all gets treated as a constant multiplier, and then I multiply that by the derivative of y cubed or 3y squared, giving me negative 2y plus 15x squared y squared. All right, let's try a few more. We can do the same thing, or extend it, I guess I should say, to functions of three variables. In each case, we can only treat one variable as a true variable at a time. All of the other variables need to be treated as constants. So in this function of three variables, I could actually find three derivatives, one with respect to x, one with respect to y, and one with respect to z. Let's do them all. For f with respect to x, both y and z are treated as constants. So let's see, x is the only variable, meaning I'd have a constant multiplier of 2y times the derivative of x squared, 2x. Minus, everything here is treated as a constant, right? y's and z's are treated as constants, so that whole term has a derivative of 0. Plus, same idea here, there are no x's, x is the only variable, so that whole term is constant its derivative is 0. So I'm just going to get 4xy. 
All right, let's try f sub y. The other variables, x and z, are treated as constants this time. So my first term, 2x squared is a constant multiplier times the derivative of y, which would be 1, minus, second term here, 10z squared is my constant multiplier, times the derivative of y squared, or 2y, plus, that whole term is constant, so its derivative is 0. And I have 2x squared minus 20yz squared. All right, last one, f sub z, so x and y, are treated as constants. And that means the whole first term is constant, and its derivative is 0. Minus constant multiplier of 10y squared times the derivative of z squared, or 2z, plus 24z squared. So I have negative 20y squared z plus 24z squared. Now, you may already be there, but certainly as you get more comfortable, of course, keep in mind that you'll probably stop writing this intermediate step, and I would anticipate that you'd get to the point pretty quickly where you'll just kind of be able to write down the answers for these nice simple polynomial types of functions and their derivatives. Let's take a look at a couple of problems where we might not need to start considering things like product rules, quotient rules, chain rules, all that kind of good stuff. So in example three, our original function is z equals e to the xy squared, and I'd like both of the derivatives. We'll start with the partial of z with respect to x. Sorry, doing so many videos here. I got my pen worn out. I had to go find a new one. Uh, let's try that one more time. So let's see. The partial derivative of z with respect to x means I'm treating y as a constant. Now the derivative of the exponential function is always, first of all, just itself. So I'll start by just repeating that. But then, of course, we use our chain rule, right? And we have to take the derivative of what's in the exponent. And in this case, with respect to x, that would just be a 1 times the constant y squared. So we'd have y squared e to the xy squared. Similarly, the partial derivative of z with respect to y, we would still start out by saying the derivative of the exponential function is simply itself. And this time, when I take the derivative of the exponent with respect to y, I'd have the constant x times 2y. And so I get 2xy, e to the xy squared. All right, let's try example four. Here's my function, y cubed times the cosine of xy. And again, I want both derivatives. So we'll start with the partial derivative of z with respect to x. And I claim that's actually the quicker of the two, easier of the two, however you want to think of it, because I do not need to think of this as a product rule problem when I'm doing the derivative with respect to x. y is a constant, right? That means that this y cubed is a constant multiplier. And so I can just keep it the way it is. Constant multiplier of y cubed times the derivative, which the derivative of cosine xy would be negative sine of xy, times, here comes the chain rule part, with respect to x, this derivative would be 1y. So I actually end up with minus y to the fourth, sine xy. 
All right, what about the derivative of z with respect to y? This time I do need to think about a product rule because notice that my variable, y, is in both factors. It's in the y cubed factor and it's also part of that cosine factor. So I am going to need to use the product rule here. So I take the first y cubed times the derivative of the second, negative sine xy, and then here comes the chain rule. Remember that the variable this time is y, so x is my constant multiplier, times the derivative of y, which is 1, plus second half of the chain rule, the second factor, cosine xy, times the derivative of the first, 3y squared. So I end up with negative xy cubed sine xy plus 3y squared cosine xy. Normal product rule, first times the derivative of the second, plus second times the derivative of the first. But then we had to keep in mind which was the variable, which was the constant. All right, one more example like these. We've got a function of three variables here in example five. R, S, and T are our independent variables. And I'm actually only asking us to find g sub r and g sub t this time. G sub s, of course, would exist. I'm just not asking for it. So let's start with g sub r. First question to ask yourself, do you need a product rule? I'm going to argue that no, we do not. I probably would want to think of this as t squared times rs plus rt to the 1 half. But when I think about the two factors here. When r is the variable, r is only part of the second factor. That means t squared is a constant multiplier and does not require a product rule. So I'm going to go ahead and say t squared, I'm going to keep that constant multiplier just the way it is, and then multiply it by this derivative, which would be 1 half, rs plus rt to the negative 1 half, and then chain rule here, the derivative of what's in those parentheses with respect to r would be 1s plus 1t. And let's see, not a whole lot I have to do here. Let me write that as t squared times s plus t. And then I've already got that 2 in the denominator. I'm going to go ahead and take that negative one-half power and just rewrite it as a square root in the denominator. So there's a slightly cleaned up form of my derivative. All right, let's try g sub t. This time I would argue that I do need a product rule. The variable is t, and notice that t appears in both factors. So, product rule. We take the first times the derivative of the second, the first t squared, times the derivative of the second, one half rs plus rt to the negative one half. And chain rule here. With respect to t, notice the derivative of the rs is just going to be zero. The derivative of the rt would be r times 1, or just r. All right, plus second half of the product rule. Second times the derivative of the first. Oops, rt to the 1 half, so the second factor, times the derivative of the first, which would just be 2t. So again, not a whole lot to do here, just maybe clean it up to make it look a little nicer. Um, I would have an rt squared on the top here, 
and then I could put in the denominator that 2 times the square root plus 2t, and I guess if I used a square root here, maybe I'll go back to a square root here as well, just for consistency, and write my final answer like that. All right, so that's just a little bit of practice and actually the mechanics of doing partial derivatives. I will come back and finish this section in one more video. We'll look at some higher order derivatives and then maybe just one quick application.